Please subscribe, like and share our videos. Exclusive content brought to you here on Latif Yahya's channel only. Latif Yahya has asserted his rights under the Copyright, Designs, and Patents Act, 1988 to be identified as the author of this work. This book is sold subject to the condition that it shall not, by way of trade or otherwise, be left, resold, hired out, or otherwise circulated without the author's prior consent in any form of binding or cover other than that in which it is published and without a similar condition including this condition being imposed on the subsequent purchaser. Chapter 7. Assassination Attempt At first glance, Ali Hassan al-Majid looks a carbon copy of Saddam Hussein. He's about the same height and has roughly the same stature, although with the noticeable beginnings of a beer belly. He even has an identical mustache and haircut to the president. The only real difference is he only ever appears in military uniform. Al-Majid also originates from the Tikrit area and is Saddam Hussein's cousin. In the 1970s, he was a deputy officer serving under President Ahmad Hassan al bekers army. One notable feature of this NCO's service record is his indescribable barbarity. This butcher is especially ruthless in his brutal treatment of the Kurds. The Kurds have been struggling for liberation and independence for decades. It isn't just limited to Iraq as the Kurdish population is distributed across five countries, Turkey, Iran, Syria, some states of the former Soviet Union and Iraq. Even former President Ahmad Hassan al bekker found them a thorn in his side, as the Kurdish Peshmergas were involved in a violent struggle against his regime in Baghdad. They are fanatical, ferocious fighters. Peshmerga translates to those who look death in the face. The Peshmerga fighters made their base in caves of the Makak Mountains in northern Iraq. From there, they attacked oil fields in Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. The Kurdish raiders mainly originated from Iran and their guns and other weapons came almost exclusively from the arsenals of the Iranian army. The government in Baghdad used everything in its power to defeat and kill the rebels including MiG fighters, helicopter gunships and several divisions of crack ground troops. But all proved no match for the Peshmergas. In the early 1970s, Ali Hassan al-Majid took part in the civil war. During an advance by Iraqi ground troops, he was captured by the Peshmergas and taken prisoner. He was sentenced to be shot but the Peshmergas hesitated too long. He bribed one of his guards promising the guard of fortune and the career of his dreams in Baghdad through his blood relationship with Saddam Hussein. The corrupt warder freed al-Majid and the two men made it to Baghdad. Once there, instead of keeping his promise to the Kurd he owed his life to, al-Majid killed the guard. The escape and murder made front-page headlines in Iraq. Ali Hassan al-Majid became a hero and was promoted to officer. He quickly rose through the Ba'ath Party ranks, too. Not surprisingly, as Saddam Hussein supported his cousin's speedy promotion and approved of his ruthlessness. That was back in 1972, just as the struggle for power between President al bekker and popular people's favorite Saddam Hussein was becoming apparent. Eventually, al bekker became just a figurehead. Saddam Hussein agreed all the treaties. In 1975, he signed a treaty with the Persian Shah Reza Pahlavi, who was temporarily in control of the disputed shipping rights in the Shat al-Arab. Baghdad withdrew its claims to the left bank. In return, the ruler of Tehran promised not to support and supply the Kurdish separatists fighting to free their region from Baghdad. The deal meant Saddam could strike at the weakened Kurds who represented 20% of his country's population. It meant Al-Majid could renew his personal vendetta against the Kurds with a vengeance. His troops killed thousands and hundreds of thousands more were uprooted. But even the most harsh treatment didn't knock the fight out of the Kurds and the conflict smoldered on. After this first outburst of killing in northern Iraq, Saddam Hussein sent his attack dog to the south. Saddam was to make one further concession to the Shah of Persia. From 1987, Iraq stopped granting political asylum to members of the Iranian opposition. These Iranian dissidents lived in southern Iraq where the population is predominantly Shiite, Saddam is a Sunni Muslim. 
the Shiites had repeatedly voiced their disapproval of what they perceived as the godless Western type of society the Ba'ath Party had created in Baghdad. This protest movement was led by Ayatollah Bekir al Sadr. One of his guests and close friends was Ayatollah Khomeini. He was banished from Iran by the Shah and went into exile in Iraq. He'd been living in the holy city of Najaf for 14 years under continual surveillance by the Iraqi secret service and strictly forbidden to spread his fundamentalist beliefs. In 1978, when Shiite opposition increased, Saddam signed a second treaty with the Shah which banished all Iranian exiles from Iraq, including Ayatollah Khomeini. The Ayatollah moved to Paris where he plotted the downfall of the Shah but he never forgot the humiliation of being kicked out of Iraq and his bitter hatred for Saddam Hussein was evident when he came to power. With Saddam's blessing, Al-Majid brought terror to Najaf. Bekir al sadr the leader of the Shiite, Dawah organization was arrested and imprisoned as were his two sisters. On Al-Majid's orders, Bekir al sadr was strangled in his prison cell and his sisters hanged. The official charge against Bekir al sadr was incitement plus a plot on Saddam's life. The Dawah party was outlawed and its supporters threatened with the death penalty. It wasn't an idle threat. Al-Majid approved the execution of large numbers of Shiites. 20,000 more fled Iraq to Iran. In 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini returned to Iran. The religious fervor he created toppled Saddam's ally the Shah and turned Iran into a religious dictatorship. To combat this, Saddam began a political and psychological PR campaign to incite the Arab world against Iran. At every summit meeting he attended, he used his considerable oratory power to warn that Arab Sunnis, of which he was one, could have their freedoms curbed by fanatical, religious Shiites. Iran under Ayatollah Khomeini is a hostage to humanity, he warned and many Western statesmen took note and supported him. On 22nd of September 1980, Saddam put his words into direct action. He declared war on his long-term enemy, Ayatollah Khomeini. Six Iraqi divisions comprising of 400,000 soldiers invaded Iran. It was intended to be a blitzkrieg resulting in a quick victory. It wasn't. The war has now been going on for eight long years. Although Saddam Hussein gives repeated assurances that Iraq will win, no Iraqi believes him. Fighting is continually flaring up in northern Iraq as Iraqi Kurds, who had sought refuge in Iran, launch regular attacks. On 16 March 1988, just two weeks after my debut performance as Uday's body double, Saddam sent Al-Majid to Kurdistan on a fiendish mission. By now Al-Majid's official title is Iraqi Home Affairs Minister with virtually unlimited power and influence. In order to bring the Kurdish uprising to an immediate end, Al-Majid had proposed using poison gas. This had been supplied by President Reagan's US administration for use in the Iraq-Iran conflict when things looked bleak for Iraq. Al-Majid took inhuman cruelty to an extreme level. He ordered mustard gas to be sprayed from helicopters at an altitude of just 30 feet to maximize the deadly effect. In just one village, Halabia, 5,000 people died. Women, children, old people were all poisoned. No one stood a chance. In a radius of several kilometers around the village, every living thing died, trees, plants, animals and people. As a result of this atrocity, Al-Majid became known as Chemical Ali. In Project Number 7, the poison gas attack wasn't openly discussed but everyone in Iraq knew about it because pictures of its terrible aftermath were repeatedly shown on the news. I particularly thought it wise to keep my mouth shut as Uday knew my grandparents were Kurds. And I knew he hated the Peshmergas, a wild, murdering mountain people encouraged by Israel and Iran. They are sheer murderers. That was his summing up and, they should all be exterminated, was his verdict. Luckily, I was excluded from this death sentence because, like a hundred thousand other Kurds, I'd been born and raised in Baghdad. We Baghdadi Kurds are considered to be fully integrated Iraqis and loyal to the Saddam regime. There are even a few Kurds in the government. The whole world was furious and indignant about this use of poison gas and even some members of the president's inner circle called him a criminal. The most damning criticism came from the chief of police, Faisal Barat. He must have thought his job protected him and publicly complained about Home Affairs Minister Al-Majid. 
It was the last thing he ever did as he was immediately executed together with 20 of his close colleagues. Saddam Hussein personally executed another of his outspoken critics, Health Minister Rijad Ibrahim. This brave but foolish man condemned the use of poison gas against Kurdish civilians just as he'd criticized its use in the Iraq-Iran war. Ibrahim even demanded Saddam's resignation in parliament. One can imagine Saddam's fury. Ibrahim didn't have to imagine it, he experienced it at first hand. Saddam drew his gun, pulled Ibrahim's head back by his hair and shot him in the mouth. That brought the ministerial session to an abrupt and bloody conclusion and also any discussion on Saddam's leadership as well. But it also triggered a resistance movement which quickly spread throughout Iraq. Both the Kurd rebels in the north and the underground fighters of the Shiite Dawah in the south declared war on the regime. Literally dozens of assassination attempts followed but Saddam seemed to have a charmed life and survived them all. No Iraqi heard anything about these in public. These developments brought about one major change. Previously, Saddam Hussein had made a conscious effort to be close to his people. He traveled to remote villages, unexpectedly visiting ordinary family homes, giving them encouragement and support. Of course, he always traveled with several hundred bodyguards who watched over him and cordoned off whole parts of the towns he visited prior to his arrival. But he did appear to the people. Such spontaneous visits became increasingly rare and finally stopped altogether. At least by him in person. Over the past few years, Saddam had sent his fides. This proved to be a wise precaution because, Shortly before I was recruited by Uday, Saddam's first fide was assassinated by Dawah terrorists. So the use of a fide isn't just an egotistical whim of Uday's. It's a sensible measure and his survival probably depends on it as an attack on the president's eldest son and heir could come anywhere and at any time. Uday's fully aware of that and it also becomes increasingly obvious to me after the gas attack on Halabia. I'd previously been more absorbed in enjoying his playboy lifestyle but now the events of the last few days have underlined the darker, dangerous side to my role. The presidential family need public appearances. Saddam's second double, Foaz al-Amari is working overtime attending numerous events. I see him time and time again on television. I know it's Foaz as Munyam Hamd always sniggers. I can't spot any obvious giveaways that the man on the screen is not Saddam but those in the know recognize the body double immediately. My second appearance is already being planned. It's set for the 28th April and sounds much more difficult and dangerous than sitting in the VIP box of a football stadium. I'm being sent to the front line in the south to rally the 4th Division. The 28th April is Saddam's birthday and celebrations will be held throughout the whole of Iraq. The 4th Division is currently south of Basra, the center of the Dawah resistance. The plan is I will be flown there with my bodyguards by helicopter. We'll land at our military HQ where I'll be greeted by the commanders and officers and be briefly updated on the current situation. Yasim, Uday's dresser, brings me Uday's black officer's military uniform, a gun and a belt. We're scheduled to depart at 8 a.m. and we do to the minute. The helicopter flight to Basra and the military HQ takes two hours. We land on the parade ground. Several companies of soldiers are lined up, rank and file in front of their commander and several other officers. Munyam Hamd, Captain Syed Hassan Hashim al Nasri, and Captain Saadi Dam Hassa al Nasri all get out the helicopter first. Then my bodyguard and finally me. I stride over to the commander. Munyam Hamd introduces me and the commander leads me along the lineup so I can inspect his troops. Then the photographers are allowed to approach, including a film cameraman who's a member of Munyam Hamd's team and records most of Uday's public appearances for television. We're photographed and filmed for more than 10 minutes. During this time, the conversation between myself and the commander is completely trivial. I ask how things are going at the front. The commander gives a glowing, optimistic report and assures us how delighted both he and his soldiers are that I am here and so they are able to congratulate the great leader Saddam Hussein on this auspicious day of his birth to his eldest son in person. From his reaction, I'm positive he has never met the president or Uday before which is a huge relief to me. I'm careful not to make any promises or raise political issues. Matters of military strategy are dealt with by Saadi Dam Hassa al-Nasiri. 
We stay at the military HQ for a good two hours and end up drinking to the good health and long reign of our leader and president. When we fly back to Baghdad and return safely to project number seven, Uday is given the cameraman's recording to watch. His reaction is just as ecstatic as before, fantastic. He heaps praise on me. 100%, once again, he enthuses. After this, public appearances are lined up thick and fast. The most important of these is a visit from an Arab delegation which is arranged for the 7th May. They are representatives from various different sports associations who plan to stay in Baghdad for a few days. This visit clashed with Uday's schedule. He'd planned a trip to Europe and, Uday being Uday, wasn't prepared to inconvenience himself for anyone. The plan sounds risky to me. I'm to meet and greet the delegates at the airport and accompany them to the hotel where the conference will be held. Uday himself will open the conference and host the discussions for two days. Then he'll jet off to Europe and it'll be my responsibility to close the conference and send the delegation on their way home. It means they'll see both me and Uday in close quarters and very soon after seeing the other. If there are any discrepancies between us, they'll surely be noticed. It's the morning of the 7th May. I'm sitting with my bodyguards in the airport reception area waiting for Uday's distinguished guest to land. None other than the heads of the sports associations of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Bahrain. To my relief, when I greet them, none of them seems to notice anything, although the Kuwaiti representative does say something which causes concern. After I shake his hand and welcome him to Iraq, he passes on greetings from my friend Fahd and asks if he can return my greeting back to Fahd. Of course, I have no idea who Fahd is but I play along and graciously consent to his request. Not until I'm back in my car does Munyam Hamd explain about Fahd. Uday has known him for years, he says, Fahd al Ahmed al Sabah is the brother of the Emir of Kuwait. I later learn he's also the vice president of FIFA, the International Football Association as well as president of the Kuwaiti Football Association and chairman of the Kuwait Olympic Committee. So it's just as well he got my greeting. After welcoming the delegation at the airport, we all travel to the Olympic Club where they'll all be staying. There, I make a discreet exit and Uday takes my place. No one is aware of the switch. After lunch, Uday disappears again. I see him in a back room for a few minutes to be briefed on any developments I need to know. He tells me the people bore him. It's up to me to escort them to the conference center at the Ashtar Sheridan Hotel in Baghdad. That evening Uday entertains the group but it appears that those particular gentlemen really do bore him because the next morning, the 8th May, he announces he intends flying to Europe a day earlier than he originally planned. This sparks a tense debate. Munyam Ham tries to persuade Uday that it's unwise which was unwise in itself. Uday has clearly made his mind up so that's that. His statement makes it abundantly clear. Latif must do it and if anything goes wrong, I'll throw him to the dogs. Quite apart from the conference, another major event is in Uday's diary. On the 9th May, the Iraqi national football team is playing a friendly match against a top European club side. They're flying into Baghdad on the afternoon of the 8th May. It's complete chaos but Uday doesn't care. He just leaves us to sort it out. Fortunately, Munyam Hamd has a cool head. For reasons I'm never told about, Uday is suddenly excused further involvement in the sports conference, but I still have to go to the airport and greet the foreign footballers. It's a bit of a home win for me as none of them has the faintest idea what Uday Hussein looks like. A bit worryingly, the footballers are also staying at the Sheridan. Everything's rather hectic and stressful but all seems to go to plan. No one notices anything different about Uday and the journalists write excellent articles about his participation. The most glowing reports appear in Al-Baz Al-Rijadi and Babel. That's hardly surprising as both newspapers belong to Uday. The director of both papers is Abbas Al-Janabi who was appointed to the post as a placation from Uday after he'd raped Al-Janabi's niece. The friendly football match kicks off on the 9th May at 4 p.m. in the People's Stadium. The conference delegates are also sitting in my VIP presidential box. All around the rest of the stadium, Iraqi spectators are loudly cheering on their national team. All to no avail as the Iraqi team loses. 
It's a disaster. How can such a national humiliation possibly happen in our own backyard? Iraqi teams or armies must never lose. I scowl throughout the match then put a brave face on it as I hand out medals to the winning foreigners and invite both teams to dinner at the Sheridan as per my instructions. The dinner is formal. My entourage and myself don't stay for long. Nothing special, or dreadful, happens that my escorts would have to report to Uday. Both the European team and the conference delegates fly out the next day when I'm again at the airport to see them off. I feel relieved but pleased at how it all went. I'm optimistic Uday will be pleased with me and his dogs will go hungry when he gets back from his holiday. Uday's in Switzerland, Geneva, his favorite European destination. He flies there on a regular basis as do most of the dictator's family. Only Saddam Hussein avoids these trips which would pose too many problems for him. His face is too well known in Europe but the rest of his family are relatively unknown to the world outside Iraq. When he's in Geneva, Uday always stays with his uncle, Farzan al-Tikriti. Farzan al-Tikriti is a half-brother of Saddam Hussein and this has proved a fast-track ticket to an incredible career. He started as an army officer but quickly became head of the Iraqi secret service. In that capacity, he frequently invited the PLO terrorist, Abu Nidal, to Iraq and even appeared with him in public. But his main responsibility is not wooing terrorists but administering the Saddam clan's incredible fortune. Because of this role, he's known in Iraq as the secret finance minister. In the eyes of the world, Barzan al tikriti went to Geneva as the Iraqi representative to the UN. But his more important task is seemingly at odds with this. It's to oversee the safe transfer of Saddam's money from Iraq to Switzerland in addition to buying all the country's weapon systems. Barzan is the key figure in the purchase of nuclear equipment. International companies are practically knocking his door down, I overheard Uday say before he flew off. Uday returns from Geneva on the 18th May. He's in a foul mood. Milad accompanies him to project number 7. Milad is a glamorous flight attendant. It's not long before I'm told by Uday's bodyguards the reason for Uday's temper. He lost heavily in the casino. There aren't any casinos in Switzerland so he went on a trip to a neighboring country in his private jet. Accompanying him were his bodyguards and his friends might, said Kamune, Ahmad Kola and Darid Ganaoui as well as the pilot, co-pilot, the jet's aviation technician and other stewardesses who work under Milad. Uday has slept with Milad several times and, since the first, has always insisted she's the head stewardess on all his trips abroad. Milad is tall, slender, has long brown hair, a big mouth with full, sensual lips and a skin so pale and tender that you can see her veins glimmering through. Uncle Barzan al Tikriti was also on the casino trip. Never one to do things in moderation, Uday had taken over a million dollars to gamble with. He loves gambling. You can only win big if you play big stakes, he reasons. He's right and sometimes he does win a fortune. But playing by such a rule means you can also lose heavily and this time that's exactly what Uday did. Lady Luck deserted him in whatever combination of numbers he bet on, other numbers won. Uday had the croupiers changed several times and even had the house rule concerning maximum stake waived to give him a chance to win back his losses. It meant Uday could bet more than the other players. The higher the sums involved, the more trance-like Uday became and more determined. I've seen him like this before. Red blotches appear on his face, his expression becomes hard and rigid and the most trivial thing makes him furious and raging mad. He simply can't stand it when something doesn't go the way he wants. He can't bear it if anyone contradicts him or if his will is not everyone's supreme law. Unfortunately for Uday, roulette wheels aren't impressed by his egotistical bravado and neither are foreign croupiers with their fixed smiles. They simply raked in his losing tokens until Uday lost every one of his million dollar stake money and had to start writing out checks. Barzan al tikriti tried to stop him but Uday wouldn't listen because he was completely sure he'd win back the money he'd lost. It was as though he was intoxicated which he was as well. He knocked back cognac after cognac until he'd lost over four million dollars. I thought to lose that massive sum in a single gambling session must be exaggerated but everyone swore it was absolutely true. To top it all, 
Uncle Barzan walked out of the casino rather than give his nephew any more checks which added to Uday's anger. But another gambler, also from Iraq, had a proposition for Uday. He had a safe in the casino. I'll lend you another million but Milad is mine for the night. Uday looked at Milad for a moment before nodding his agreement. Milad knew what she had to do. Uday had acted no better than a pimp. The son of the Iraqi president and who was himself president of the Iraqi Olympic Committee sold a woman so his friend would lend him money for gambling. An outrageous scandal. Uday lost that million, too. When Uday returns from Europe, he's dragging Milad along behind him by her wrist. They go into his study. Uday doesn't bother closing the door so we can all hear him shouting at Milad. What did he do to you? Tell me. What? Milad must think it best to say nothing. Uday hits her. We wince at the sound of the slaps that carry as far as the swimming pool area. What? Tell me what? Uday continues to shout. Milad is crying. Uday hits her again and eventually beats the truth out of her. She snaps and yells back at him. He said you were presumptuous and arrogant. He bought me to teach you a lesson. That's what he said. And he wanted me to tell you that. Uday has the weeping Milad taken away. We all know we'll never see her again. As if that wasn't enough for one day, Uday comes to see me. He's still fuming and, when he hears the Iraqi national team lost the football match, he completely loses his temper. This time he takes it out on me. He hits me, ignoring my observation that it was only a friendly match and there are always winners and losers. He doesn't listen and shouts at Azam to get me out of his sight. They take me to a cell in the secret service building where I spend a solitary two weeks. I count my blessings. At least it's bigger than my original cell and isn't painted red. Also the food is tolerable, the guards treat me well and there's no one trying to assassinate me. On the fifteenth day of my stay, bodyguards collect me. Instead of taking me to project number seven, they escort me to the Al Hayat which is still within the palace grounds. It's a modern building nine stories high run by the secret service. I'm shown to a kind of office come flat. It has a sitting room with a desk, a side room with a toilet and a bathroom. A single bed is in the sitting room. Uday comes to visit me. This time he's the friendly, calm and superior Uday. He comes up so close to me that I can feel his breath on my face. He takes off his Ray-Bans, glares into my eyes and hisses like a venomous snake. Don't ever interfere in my business again. Your job is to obey me, not to talk to me. Follow for the next chapter.